Good afternoon. I call to order the meeting of the Policy Review Committee. Welcome. As the committee members will recall, during our March 11th, 2019 meeting, technical difficulties affected the live stream availability of agenda items one through three. As a result, minutes are provided for items one through three. The live stream video footage of the remainder of the meeting stand as the official minutes of that portion of the meeting. The partial minutes of the March 11, 2019 meeting are behind tab one in your binders. Are there any corrections? Ms. Howie. Yes, ma'am. Hearing none from uh, the others, there was a page that did not have the vote tally. On page four, item three, number six, there is only one vote that is recorded. Okay, thank you. Any other additions or corrections? Hearing none, the minutes are approved as presented. Our next item of business is item two, unfinished business, discipline policies update. And staff is here tonight to provide an update on the work of the superintendent's discipline work group. I welcome Dr. Martin Knox. Dr. Knox, please come forward and introduce your staff. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. This afternoon, we will provide you with updates regarding our Superintendent's Behavior and Discipline Council and the work that we've engaged in for the 2018-2019 school year. This evening, I have joining me Ms. April Lewis, the Executive Director of School Safety, and Dr. Amalio Nieves, who is the Executive Director of Student uh, Support. And my notes just froze. So I'm going to go ahead and, and speak to you regarding the work that we've engaged in thus far. Um, beginning the 2018-19 school year with the direction and charge of our superintendent, we formulated a superintendent's behavior and discipline council. The purpose of the council uh, formulating is to examine all of our policies, specifically those in the 5000 series, that will help navigate and guide our work and provide recommendations to the superintendent. Many of our policies, we've been engaged in the work and making sure there's an alignment to the best of our ability to state regulations as they've adjusted and changed. And thus far, we've really um, engaged our council with research and best practices prior to discussing any of the policies that we've brought forward thus far. The last time we met as a council, we actually had a presentation from Maryland Rights Disability as well as the Maryland Justice Center. And those participants actually shared with us um, the expectations in terms of how we should uh, engage in the work and making sure we're aligned to Maryland standards and the legal expectations. During that time, we were reminded of the guidelines as it pertains to pre-K through two suspensions and how we should look at students and if students aren't posing an imminent danger, we should refrain from suspending those students. Um, we've also looked at the adjustments as it relates to uh, making sure that principals have the authority to make the final decision in terms of moving forward with student suspensions. There have been three policies that have come through PRC at this time for approval, and one is on the table for first, second, and third reader. And when we come back together as a team in May, um, we will review the final four policies as they relate to the work um, that we've been engaging in. I can tell you the specific policies as soon as my iPad unfreezes. Dr. Nieves, I just sent them to you. Thank you. So as we've engaged in the work, um, we've looked at policies 5550, 5560, which have been brought forward to you. The last time we met on March the 6th, we began working on 5510, 5530, and 5540. Our final meeting will be held in May, and we will resume our discussion focused on 5500, which is the Student Code of Conduct, 5520, 5561, and 5580. And as I shared with you before, prior to us engaging in any dialogue regarding our policies, 
We make sure that there's an alignment to Maryland expectations and the regulations, as well as research and effective practices that are taking place around the nation. So we will continue and we will have our final meeting of the year in May, and we look forward to bringing you updated information and recommendations to move those policies forward. Thank you. At this time, do any board members have any questions for Dr. Knox? Can I just ask you to repeat the next four policies that will come forward to the uh, PRC? Yes, ma'am. I believe it's 55, not I believe, they are 5500, 5520, 5561, and 5580. Okay, thank you. Our next item is item three, new business, policy 3230, qualifications of vendors. For that, I ask Mr. Kevin Smith and Mr. George Saris to come forward. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Smith could not be here, and so he's asked me to present, and uh, Mrs. Ms. Burnop is here as well. Good afternoon, Ms. Burnop. Uh, so the changes here were relatively minor, uh, basically conforming to the uh, policy review committee's editing conventions and deleting uh, paragraph uh, 2C because it is duplicative of paragraph 2B. Okay, board members, is there any discussion? Ms. Rowe? Is there another policy that addresses um, specifically prohibiting vendors from having certain conflicts of interest with the school system or requiring vendors to disclose those? Or is that something that should be taken up in this policy? Um, I don't have the answer to that question. Um, let's see here. Let me look. If I remember correctly, we do have something in the general terms and conditions. I don't believe it's in a specific policy, however. So policy 3209. Uh, reads the competitive nature of public purchasing and the efficient use of public funding require that ethical standards be incorporated into all purchasing functions. Accordingly, all purchasing activities on behalf of the Baltimore County Public Schools shall be subject to the board's ethics code. Um, let me just see if there's anything else that's specifically refers to vendors. Obviously, employees must disclose mm -hmm. all potential conflicts. Um, I, don't re I don't remember. Would you like us to get the terms and conditions? Well, if it's in the terms and conditions, I guess I'm just wondering if the board wants to have something in policy that says something to the effect of um, prohibiting vendors from having certain conflicts of interest with school staff, county staff, and elected officials. And we would have to work on the language of that, but um, my intention would be to make it clear in the policy that the vendors should also disclose if they're aware of conflicts of interest. Ms. Rowe, I had 
um, in my notes to recommend an amendment to the policy on line um, 15. So that sentence starts on line 13 and it reads, all procurement activity conducted by Baltimore County Public Schools shall be done in accordance with federal and state laws and regulations. And I was going to make a motion that the board would amend it to include and board policies, including but not limited to all ethic policies, because we have specific ethic policies around vendor interactions mm -hmm. that I think would cover the concerns that you're raising. I don't believe we have anything that requires the vendor to disclose if they are aware if their company has um, conflict of interest considerations. There's nothing requiring the vendor to disclose that if they're aware of that in our policies. I, I am pretty sure it's in the bid specifications, the standard contractual language that is incorporated into every contract. Um, but that document I don't have with and, me. And the first policy that um, Mr. Saris read is broad and wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. be limited to just employees. Sure. Uh, the first policy is broad and it would not limit that um, Mr. Harris read, it would not limit itself to just employees. It, could, it involves the whole purchasing process. And then the specifications support that. But we could bring back the terms and conditions to the committee. Which policy is that, Ms. Burnup? 3209 is the one that I was reading from. It's purchasing principles. It's the broad overarching policy that affects all of the other policies that come beyond. Does, 30, does 3209, I'm going to pull it up here. Does it include language to include the board's ethics policies? Yes, yes. in 2B. I agree with adding the ethics policies in there, in the policy, into the language. I just wonder if it gets, I guess what I'm really looking for is something in the policy that prohibits elected officials from owning businesses from also having contracts with the school system because we have several situations like that. Ms. Howie, would you speak to that? Because I don't believe that that's a legal, I don't think that's legal for the school system to specifically prevent certain types of vendors. The issue is whether the vendors are complying with our ethics policies and other terms and conditions. So the question would be whether or not simply by virtue of a particular individual's position that position would automatically exclude the individual from doing business with the school system. And there could be some cases where uh, certain individuals could be excluded, but as a blanket statement, I'm not sure that, number one, it's enforceable, uh, and number two, that we're going to be able to know in every case uh, exactly what the relationships are. We can ask, and as I said, I believe we do ask uh, in the bid specs and in our general terms and conditions. Uh, so we do ask. So is it, is it illegal to prevent county elected officials who own businesses or state delegates and senators who own businesses from having contracts with the school system or is that something we'd have to put in our policies as an ethics or conflict of interest policy? You would have to expressly include it if every elected official is to be excluded from doing business. That would have to be expressly included. That's not what we want to do. And that would it seems to me is slightly broader than just a conflict of interest because a conflict of interest involves putting undue pressure 
on right. individuals that are making the purchasing decision, which includes the board. Well, considering that elected officials are fiduciary authorities and they have the ability to give the school system funding and also withhold the school system funding, it seems to me that it would be a conflict of interest if an elected official were also at the same time trying to sell the school system goods and services and hold contracts. If, if we're contracting to the same elected officials who have the ability to give or take funding, to me that seems like a conflict of interest. So do you mean state and county officials? And board, and board members? Yeah, sure. I think they all have a fiscal relationship but not a fiduciary relationship, which means a legal position of responsibility for our finances. I think there's a difference between having a financial interest or being a fiduciary in a, in a statutory or financial sense. Like a, um, a fiduciary is somebody who bears a legal responsibility to the financial security and stability of an organization. Okay. But so from my perspective, that's semantics. From my perspective, I would, I would not object to a policy that prohibited state and local elected officials or even federal elected officials in our state. So like our federal congressmen and senators who are, I, I think that having elected officials who have businesses and have contracts with the school system is very problematic given the nature of politics and everything else. And I think that having that, um, it's worth this board deliberating on the subject and I think it's worth mm -hmm. making a decision that we either want that in the policy or we don't. Mr. Offerman? Not that I, uh, I'm not making a judgment on, on, your, on, on, your, on your suggestion, but uh, wh why would we limit it to elected officials? Why, why wouldn't it be appointed officials also? Sure, okay. Okay. Uh, having, ha having said that, I don't think it's specifically necessary with the other things in place myself, but that's just my opinion. Are there any other board member comments on that issue? before I give my opinion. <laughs> Ms. Adekoya. I guess I just don't quite understand the scope of how, once implemented, like I feel as if it will affect a great, like it will be very effective, but in a negative way. I don't, like I, oh. I guess I just don't understand Okay, why. so. Hypothetically, and I'm completely making this up because I don't want to say anything wrong, but hypothetically, we just had a public school construction bill, right? And everyone was going to Annapolis and lobbying that bill to pass. Well, that bill didn't pass because one person made a decision to put it in a drawer, right? Now. I don't know who that one person was and I don't know anything about that person, but if that person also had a contract through their business where they were making money off the school system, that could affect a decision about whether or not to kill or let certain legislation proceed. So it creates a conflict of interest or a potential conflict or instance in a variety of different situations. And I think that if we have policies in place meant to eliminate conflict of interest, I think that would be good. And I wanted to bring the subject matter up for discussion because I have had several people in the community come to me and say the school system has a contract with this person and they own the company and they're an elected official. And without researching it thoroughly, it just caused me to want to look at our policies to see what our policies and what the laws say about that. Okay, um, my suggestion is that your concerns around um, vendor influence and conflicts of interest are relevant 
and pertinent and they are important because the goal of all of these policies and the procedures that we use are to make sure that every dollar that we use is used to the highest and best interests of our students. So we don't want to have someone with influence getting a contract where we're not where we end up paying higher than if we had uh, you know a wide variety of intensely competitive companies pr trying to provide that service or good for a highly competitive price. Um, so I, I hear your concerns. I think as regards this policy, if we wanted to amend it to include my suggestion, and then it would be appropriate to look at the ethics policies to see if the vendor influence and conflicts of interest components are current, stringent, and assuage concerns. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so I made an amendment, I made a motion to amend um, policy 3230 in line 15 to include end board policies, including but not limited to all ethics policies. Is there a second? Second. Second. Who was the first second? But, uh, Mr. Offerman, right, okay, thank you. thank you. Is there discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The vote is unanimous at five. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments or motions regarding this, Mr. Offerman? Yes. Uh, back to the line that, that you uh, that, that you referred to before, I guess it's line 13, 14, 15. Uh, uh, all procurement activities conducted by Baltimore County Public Schools PCS should be done in accordance with federal and state laws. Should we, or is there a reason to add ca county laws? Or, or county uh, 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 regulations, would that be a, a benefit to us in any way? Yes, I think that would be appropriate. Well, Ms. Howie says that would be then appropriate. I, then I'd like to vote to amend it to add uh, uh, federal and state, federal, state, and, and county laws and, and regulations. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The vote is unanimous at five. Thank you. Are there other, and, and Ms. Howie, if you would just ask to uh, clean up the uh, punctuation related to adding those additional items. And just for the, uh, for the committee's information, uh, Superintendent's Rule 3209, uh, Sub 3, Sub B indicates no contract will knowingly be awarded to an individual or business if participation violates the board's ethics code or if the ethics review panel finds that a conflict of interest. Okay. Thank you. So our policy, so the rule would already be in, in line with the addition to the policy. Okay. Um, is there any other comments or questions on this policy? Yes. So were there any observations in the external audit or in legislative audits that would necessitate editing this policy? Because some of those things aren't necessarily violations of state law, but do we need something in the policy that says, as it applies to vendors, when legislative audits and our external audits make suggestions that those suggestions should be followed, or is that not a function of policy? Well, at the um, board meeting where we received the external audit report, mm -hmm. there was a question and discussion about the next steps that are typically taken after an audit. And what was discussed by Mr. Reagan, the external auditor, is that it's typical for the board and management, in this case our superintendent and staff, to discuss a corrective action plan. So I think it would be, um, it, it wouldn't, we wouldn't have the information yet to state here whether something from the external audit would apply. I think the full board needs to have that discussion related to um, our next steps regarding the recommendations and the external audit plan. And if the full board discusses it and then wants to send policies to us or actions for us to do, then 
that would be the correct steps. I see. So we may edit our policies in light of corrective measures at the time that those have been put into place and okay, thank you. Yes. So it needs to be a full board discussion mm -hmm. and then a full board decision on the next steps that we take. Sure. Okay. Um, I did, if there's no one else, I did have one other suggestion um, to add. Um, number one, I wanted to keep in paragraph C. I didn't see the necessity to delete paragraph C and to remove establishing procedures but instead to have it read the Office of Purchasing shall be responsible for implementing the superintendent's guidelines to define, evaluate, and document a prospective vendor's ability to perform satisfactorily within the requirements of a given contract or agreement. Mr. Saris, I, I thought that even though this in paragraph B it adds a new statement about the superintendent establishing the guidelines, that the responsibility still remains with the Office of Purchasing. Would you see that as acceptable? Yes. Okay. So that so I'll make a motion to keep paragraph C and to remove the words establishing procedures and replace them with implementing superintendent guidelines so that the whole paragraph would read, the Office of Purchasing shall be responsible for implementing the superintendent guidelines to define, evaluate, and document a prospective vendor's ability to perform satisfactorily within the requirements of a given contract or agreement. Is there a second? Second. Is there additional questions or discussion? Ms. Pasture? I just need you to read your amendment again, please. <laughs> to keep paragraph C, and it would read, the Office of Purchasing shall be responsible for implementing the superintendent's guidelines to define, evaluate, and document a prospective vendor's ability to perform satisfactorily within the requirements of a given contract or agreement. Is there any other discussion or questions? All in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. The motion carries with a unanimous vote of five. The last suggestion I had is um, several of the board members had attended the National School Board Association Conference and there were a number of um, sessions related to improving board governance. And part of that is the board understanding how the policy implementation is impacting the school system. So I wanted to add a paragraph D, which is the superintendent shall provide an annual report to demonstrate adherence to policy and guidelines. So I'm making a motion to add paragraph D. Second. I'll, re I'll reread that. The superintendent shall provide an annual report to demonstrate adherence to policies and guidelines. Are there additional questions or comments? Ms. Adekoya? Will this be in every implementation or just for this one? Uh, I have it in this one and I think I added it to a, a couple other policies, mm -hmm. but not all of them. Can you repeat it one more time, please? The superintendent shall provide an annual report to demonstrate adherence to policies and guidelines. So respectfully, members of the committee, I would um, recommend, given that you are asking the superintendent as part of your governance function to report to you about the policy, it seems to me that your interest would be in adherence to this policy. So adherence to this policy, but you indicated policies and guidelines. Uh, so just so the superintendent is clear and staff is clear about the report that you're requiring is the report on adherence to policy 3230 or other policies? To this policy, 3230, and the guidelines that the superintendent creates to implement this, these policies, this policy. So again, in order to make sure staff has clear direction as to what kind of report is required, it seems to me that um, 
you'd want the superintendent to demonstrate adherence to policy or this policy and the guidelines referenced in uh, section 2 sub B. I will take that as a friendly amendment. I can't amend. Um, I'm not a member Ms. of the Ms. So would it, so we have this standard section. Rather than having this be a D under the standard section, um, it seems more appropriate to me that we, that the motion edit under implementation, the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy and annually report to the board, like add that section there as opposed to creating a subsection of standards. So you're suggesting that under paragraph three on line 31, it would say, the board directs a superintendent to implement this policy and provide an annual report to demonstrate adherence? Yes, that that's a more proper location for what you're trying to do. Would there be more after the adherence? Ms. Howe, do you think in that state, I see what you're saying, and I think that that would be a good flow. Okay. I'm going to withdraw my motion and I'm going to make a new motion, which is to amend line 31 to read the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy and provide an annual report to demonstrate adherence. Second. Is there any other comments or questions? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Ms. Pesture, are you a yay or a nay? Yay. Yay. Okay. The motion carries at unanimous vote of five. Are there any other comments on this policy? Hearing none, we're moving on to the next policy, which is 3710. And for that, so policy 3710, safety and security equipment. For that, I call forward Dr. Penelope Martin Knox and Ms. April Lewis. So good afternoon again. Joining me at the dais is Ms. April Lewis, the Executive Director of School Safety, and she will present to you information as it relates to safety upgrades. Um, Ms. Lewis has engaged a group of uh, stakeholders over the past six months to make sure that there's input from uh, our stakeholders regarding the policy. So at this time, I'll turn the mic over to Ms. Lewis. So good afternoon. I'm going to start with policy 3710 which is safety and security equipment. This policy was last updated in 2014, so we're on a five-year cycle of review for this policy. The changes in the policy also reflect the current editing conventions. With this safety and security policy, we did expand the section on standards to include three guidelines that will be used in our use of security equipment. Those include evaluating patterns of safety concerns to inform our decisions about safety equipment, conducting the annual reviews of our site-based emergency plans, and per the uh, Safe to Learn Act of 2018, we're annually reviewing those site-based emergency plans. It also includes installing surveillance and other security technology, something that we have done in the past and that we continue to do as we assess our needs and identify funding to meet those needs. Paragraph B is directly related to the Safe to Learn Act of 2018 that required school systems to identify a safety coordinator. Questions? Ms. Adekoya? 
I didn't know if we would gain anything from adding in all Baltimore County. It said, okay, so that's line eight. It says offices and schools, but other I know we own other facilities. So if we added offices, schools, board owned property facilities. I was thinking about that also in terms of bus lots, mm -hmm. the warehouse, mm -hmm. you know, we have data processing sites. So what, what language would we like in there? Mr. Offerman, you offered facilities? Yeah, just, uh, I, I, I think facilities would cover, would cover the whole range of things. In his school, uh, comma, office, comma, and, and, uh, and, and facilities safety. Facilities safety. Would you like to offer that as a motion? Yes, I'd like the motion that we add, add the word facility and facilities. Is there a second? Second. Thank you for the second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously the vote at five. Are there other questions or comments? I was just gonna take a moment and say that Baltimore County Public Schools is um, really at an advantage because of the work that you all have done around safety for our students. Um, I know that at the time that this uh, law was passed that there was already a number of those initiatives that our school system had already accomplished through your work. So I just wanted to point that out that Baltimore County really is leading the way in student safety uh, with securing our doors and the facilities and our uh, ID cards and those sorts of things. Also our partnership that, that you manage with Baltimore County Police Department through our school resource officers. It's a wonderful program, so we appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Is, is there a consideration in this policy for on buses, or is that a different policy altogether? That would be included. Yes. Okay, so the language for that is okay. where? Because we have offices, schools, and facilities, but do we need to include vehicles? Thank you. What's you, the line? Yes. You mean where we just discuss the facilities, I mean, the offices, and schools, and add transportation? Should we include or school property vehicles? So we have amended it to be offices, schools, and facilities. Should we include the word vehicles so that buses, maintenance vans, etc.? I see later on we use property owned control and leased by the board. What if we just repeated that initially from the beginning so we keep that language? That's the definition. Using the rule we talk about school property is what she's school referring property. to. Mm, said property owned. And that's any BCPS owned controlled or leased property or vehicle regardless of whether students are present. So we can just use that initially. Where is that? that we cover it's in the rule. Definition, that's the definition in the rule. In the rule. So we could lift it to the policy. Yes, okay. I make Does a motion to do that. Is, can you define that? To move the language from the rule that references transportation to the policy. Is there a Which, second? second? Any more discussion? Ms. Lewis, could you repeat the language from the rule that we would be lifting to the policy? So in the rule, we have the definition, definition of school property as any BCPS owned, <coughs> controlled, or leased property or vehicle, regardless of whether students are present. Do you accept that language? Yes. Who seconded it? Do you, do. Do you accept that? Do. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously at the vote of five. Any other questions or comments related to this policy? Ms. Howie, I just had one note of uh, line eight. There is an end bracket after the word environment. Mm -hmm. So if that could just be removed. All in favor of moving this policy forward as amended, please raise your hand. 
Motion carries at five. Thank you very much. Our next policy is policy 3720, behavior threat assessments. And that's you also. Okay. Behavior threat assessment is a new policy. It's a result of the Maryland Safe to Learn Act of 2018 that requires each school system to adopt a policy on or before September 1st, 2019 that establishes behavior assessment teams. And so we have done that in this policy. So this policy speaks to uh, terms, and I do want to uh, reference that we developed this policy based on Maryland's model policy for behavior threat assessment. Uh, we worked with the Maryland Center for School Safety to develop that policy. I had the opportunity to be a part of the committee in developing this policy. And so with that, our policy is in line with that Maryland policy. We have defined key terms that are used in the state policy. So we're consistent with those terms. We have developed or will develop two levels of teams. One will be a system-wide team, and then one team will be a school-level team. And so the guidelines and the responsibilities of those uh, threat assessment teams are identified in the policy. Thank you. Are there questions or comments from board members? Mr. Offerman? Uh, and uh, the definition is 2, two C, uh, threat, an, expre an expression of an intent to cause physical harm to someone. Uh, I would also uh, consider adding uh, or, uh, or, or uh, school property. I like to make uh, that's I like to make a motion to, to add that to the uh, to the definition. Is there a second? Mr. Offerman, what line is that? Miss Pasture seconds the motion. Is there any additional discussion, Miss Rowe? So for for this policy, given that it, it's in line with the law um, about behavioral threat assessment. Um, if we include property in that definition of the word threat, is that going to be problematic as far as determining if a student is an imminent threat? Does that definition broaden it so that if a student's going to destroy property, they're an imminent threat? So I wonder if... I'm wondering um, if that's problematic to put that there. I wonder if perhaps Ms. Lewis could give some background um, of what the events that led up to the legislation, um, the incident that occurred in St. Mary's County last year. Yes, and so in St. Mary's County last year, we had a student who was shot and later died um, at the hands of another student. And so one of the things that this policy is attempting to do is to look at the behavior, not just of students, this policy covers all individuals. Right. Okay, everyone, and to look at whether or not there are indicators of what our assessment teams can do to identify potential risk and address those risks before we have unfortunate outcomes such as we had um, in St. Mary's County and other places. So if we broaden that definition, does that make someone who, for instance, vandalizes the school a threat? Mm -hmm. And is that what we want, is that what we want to say? Because I guess my concern is it was covered in one of those, yeah. that we're that we we know the unintended consequences of adding that language. Right. So vandalism is utilized, and I believe it's in 5500 um, to cover that piece. Um, so w we can consider adding property um, because oftentimes, if you're bringing a threat towards someone, usually that someone is in a facility. If that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. For example, if you think about a bomb threat, yeah. it right. wouldn't only affect an individual, but it would affect property as well. That's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. So I guess with that explanation, I wonder if um, line 11 through 13, it says individuals behavior may pose a threat to the safety of the school, student, staff member in the school, but this it's more than the school. So what if we replace the school with a different word? And also, um, 
in lines 17 through 18, it says non-students. Could we say all students, employees, visitors, or is non-students better? Which so ones? there sometimes you could have someone who's not a student, nor are they someone that's in uh, the community that may launch a threat, and this allows us to work collaboratively with the law enforcement to address those behaviors. Additionally, we have contract, contractual folks that come. They're not employees, but they're contractors. So non-students would include employees. Okay. But the other one, the school, school, the staff member in the school, could we look at that? Which line? Which line are you, Ms. Sadakoya? 1213. Page one? Yes, only limits it to the school, but I don't know if that's. Right. The facilities. I was talking about the facilities. Oh, the first one. First one. I just want to go back and see what the law, right? I don't know if the law was Ms. specific. Ms. Adekoya, did you want to make a motion to add a specific word, or does Ms. Lewis' explanation that it references the schools, is that a sufficient explanation? Yeah, that's sufficient. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All in favor of moving forward policy 3720 as amended, please raise your hand. The motion carries with a unanimous vote of 50. I mean, excuse me, of five. Our next policy is policy 4102. And for that, we call forward Dr. John Mayo and Dr. Fran Allen. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Good evening. Dr. Allen will be discussing uh, policies 4102, which is sexual harassment, and 4201, employee insurance benefits. And we'll entertain any questions afterwards. Thank you. Um, Board of Education Policy 4102 is a personnel policy um, for employees, and it was part of the review schedule. Um, so there was conformity with the policy review committee editing conventions, plus a review obviously with um, changes that have occurred in the last several years um, with the Me Too movement and other movements, um, there was an actual change in Maryland law as well for disclosure. So changes were made to include um, those guidelines, but also to move some of the items that were previously in the rule that were also now moved to the policy to allow for the annual training, the reporting, the guidelines um, that procedures had to be in place for the reporting. Um, I don't want you, anyone to think that those procedures were not in place prior to these changes. They were, training was in place, new employees getting the policy, and um, training that had occurred through safe schools. Um, however, it was primarily in the rule rather than the policy. So moving them to the policy increases um, the guidelines and standards that have to be put into place. Board members, are there questions or comments? Ms. Rowe? So I know this probably seems obvious, but I don't see in this policy the definition of sexual harassment. And I think that given that it has a specific definition in law and in other places that we might include a specific definition in the policy. The definition is included in the rule. Um, it is included there. So can we lift that definition from the rule and include it in the policy? I'd like to make a, do you have the rule in front of you? Can you read what's in the rule, please? I do have it. Sexual harassment, unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal, nonverbal, or physical conduct of a sexual nature when 
it's pretty long. There's four points. Submission to such conduct is made either explicitly or implicitly a term or condition of an individual's um, employment. Submission to or rejection of such conduct by an individual is used as a basis for employment decisions affecting such individual. That conduct has the purpose or effect of unreasonably interfering with an individual's work performance or that conduct has the purpose or effect of creating an intimidating, hostile, or offensive working environment. Okay, so maybe language in the policy which refers to the definition in the rule so that people know precisely where to find the definition of sexual harassment because I think we would want to give the superintendent the ability to refine and change the rule without us having to change the policy, but if we had language in the policy that um, referred um, you know, sexual harassment as defined by superintendent's rule, or that language in here, so that someone reading the policy understands where they should go to get the definition. Can you make that into an abbreviated motion? Um. So I move that on line nine environment that is free from sexual harassment as defined by superintendent's rule, what is the number? 4102. 4102 will not be tolerated in, be added to this policy. So Ms. Rowe, the concern that I would have or the caution that I would have is that if for some reason uh, the behavior that's complained of is considered sexual harassment but is not covered as is currently defined in the rule, let's say for example there is a change uh, in, uh, in the law as a result of litigation. Uh, that we would then be limiting ourselves uh, by what is in the rule. So including but not limited to or as, um, as the law considers something that may broaden it. Okay, so um, so environment that is free from sexual harassment as defined by but not limited to superintendent's rule 4102. Is that acceptable, Ms. Howie? It's your policy. Does that get to the concern that you were expressing? Well, the definition is actually coming from federal law. So we use the federal law mm -hmm. definition. So um, federal law can change or a state law, so it could be federal or state regulations, so maybe defined or not limited by changes in the federal or state regulation. Because we don't use our own definition. Okay, so then maybe it should say environment that is free from sexual harassment as defined by state, federal, and local law. I make a motion, rescinding all previous motions, that the line on line nine read environment that is free from sexual harassment is, de is defined by federal, state, and local law. Is there a second? Right. Mr. Offerman, seconded, thank you. Is there further discussion or questions? All in favor, please raise your hand. Vote carries unanimously at five. Are there other comments or questions related to this policy? I would just um, make a motion to add on page two, line 12, the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy and provide an annual report on adherence. Is there a second? <coughs> Ms. Rowe, second. Any questions? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries, unanimous vote of five. 
Any other questions or comments? All those in favor of forwarding, um, of moving policy 4102 to the full board, please raise, as amended, please raise your hand. Thank you, the motion carries unanimously at five. We're moving on to policy number 4201, employee insurance benefits, and we will still hear from Dr. John Mayo and Dr. Fran Allen. So the policy was part of the schedule review for the school year. Um, it continues to establish the board's goal of providing insurance benefits for eligible employees. Um, the policy was revised to transfer language um, from various sections um, to the standard section to clarify which employees are eligible um, and to comply with the editing review conventions. Um, obviously, um, in employee insurance is an important um, attraction and retention tool for employees, um, but it also has uh, fiscal um, ramifications. And the majority of the, the insurance is determined by ratified bargaining unit agreements um, that are open um, when we look at the contracts. So the, the standards including that it would be, they would look to the collective bargaining units, um, but also determining which, specifically which insurance benefits were covered. Um, not, we offer a variety of benefits, so we need it to make sure that the group insurance benefits for eligible employees are defined as health, prescription drug, dental, and, and vision. And then we also note the um, group life insurance that is provided um, to employees in accordance with the bargaining unit agreement. Thank you. And were the bargaining units involved in the edits? Have they reviewed these edits? Um, no. No? Okay. Well, when we have um, second reader, anyone can comment on our policies, and our bargaining units are always available to come to the board to make comments. I just wanted to um, have that information. Are there other questions or comments from board members? Hearing none. All in favor of moving forward this policy to the full board, please raise your hand. The vote is unanimous, the motion carries. Our next policy we're gonna hear from, thank you Dr. Mayo, thank you Dr. Allen. The next policy we're going to hear about is policy 5320, student organizations and clubs, and for that we're hearing from Dr. Renard Adams and Dr. Boswell McComas, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, so we're here today bringing forward uh, policy 5320, um, and it's the changes are really within editing conventions. And yeah, that's that's all of the changes. <laughs> this policy was last revised in 2014, so it's on uh, I think the previous five-year schedule, and it sets forth the board's support for schools to establish student organizations and clubs, and we're only recommending um, those edits which conform to the board's and PRC's editing conventions. Are there any questions or comments regarding this policy? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor of moving this forward for first reader, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimous vote of five. Thank you for that. Thank you. And our last conversation for the evening is going to be about the cell phone policy research request, uh, which was requested uh, by Mr. Offerman, and we discussed adding it to the agenda with Ms. Howie, and so we have information to hear. Thank you. So members of the committee, you have behind tab uh, nine information concerning how cell phones are referenced currently in board policy. First of all, in Board Policy 5550, on page 3, electronic device is defined as smartphones, among other things. And there is also a Category 1 offense for use of electronic devices during regular instructional hours. Uh, in Policy 5580, uh, which prohibits bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation. Cyberbullying is defined as use of um, certain devices, including cellular phones. On the second page, 
Superintendent's Rule 6202, which is the technology acceptable use uh, policy, uh, defines technology as electronic devices, including cell phones and smart devices, and indicates that students may only use BCPS technology for completion of assignments, projects, or educational purposes. And finally, Superintendent's Rule 6500, uh, which indicates that uh, it is a violation of testing policy for staff members to use PDAs or cell phones uh, during assessments, as well it is a violation for students to do the same. So those currently are the only references to cell phones that are in board policy or superintendent's role, as per your request. Thank you, Ms. Howie, for doing that research and bringing that information um, to us. I would ask Mr. Offerman at this point to um, share with the committee a list of comments and concerns that he has um, created from a number of interested stakeholders that have contacted him and also concerns that we hear at the board. Right. Uh, there have certain, uh, while these policies uh, seem fine to me in general, uh, my, my concern is we may want to look at uh, a more definitive uh, set of uh, policies, particularly for certain areas that concern me. Uh, some of the problem areas that, that I've seen or that I've, I've heard of, and I'm sure a lot of other people have too, uh, first of all, in primary is particularly among the secondary students, uh, 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 middle school and higher, is the uh, disruption of, of uh, instruction by uh, student cell phone use. And I can see it's a category one offense, and I, I understand that. Uh, I guess I'll have to get a, a handle on, uh, to a certain degree, what, what kind of a, a problem it is or how widespread it is going on to work from. Uh, secondly, a uh, concern about classroom use involving test security. I know of several instances where people, students who've had a test and their classmates are in a different section of the same course have transmitted test information via, via a picture from the cell phone or whatever uh, to, to a class later. I know uh, there's some, I have personal experience even as long as 13 years ago with uh, AP testing and needing to uh, uh, hold the student's cell phones to, during the entire testing time so they wouldn't be available if a student would, uh, would take a break or even be able to use it if they weren't seen using it in the, uh, uh, in the actual testing time frame. Uh, the other issue is video and, uh, and photo use, uh, which is certainly part of uh, potential for uh, bullying. Uh, and, and obviously it's a cyber bill b um, bullying, but the, the, those areas, uh, they have me concerned or, uh, enough that I'd, I'd like to take a, a, a deeper look into this at, at this time. Uh, and I, while this is not a policy uh, re recommendation, I would like to consider the, uh, uh, doing uh, some kind of a survey split up between classroom teachers, school administrators, students, and parents and guardians about their opinion of uh, what's appropriate for cell phone possession and use in, in the school building, in the classroom, and in school-related activities. Uh, that's where I am at the moment. Uh, I, obviously, I'm not real focused on exactly what we want to do, but I, I would like to hear from anybody else that has opinions on this in this, in this committee before we take any further. Okay, Ms. Adekoya, and then Ms. Rowe, and then Ms. Pastor. So I definitely would like to know as well how widespread of an issue it is because with every school comes a different climate and it might be an apparent issue in one school, but you might run into the problem that in 10 other schools on one side it's not that huge of a problem. And um, I guess I'd like to know with, with this cell phone, I've been hearing it ever since I've been in school, so what idea would you how would a classroom look like? What policy, what rule would be set in place to put a hold to it? It's just always been a question about like, what, what would somebody recommend to handle the cell phone issue? Mr. Offerman? Just if I can uh, respond to that, that, there's some talk about possibility of uh, classroom cell phone holders while the students are at their seats instructionally, uh, which would of course greatly limit the student access to a cell phone door and, from the primary instructional time. There's also worries about that because their security and having the cell phone taken by somebody else. And you know, so this is not a, I'm not at any point where I'm ready to make a policy recommendation. I, I, I wanna do, I guess, more, a lot of, a, a, a lot of, a lot more fact finding and uh, 
and uh, gathering of uh, opinions from those who deal with it on, on a, uh, a, a daily basis. Ms. Rowe? So just to, I agree with Mr. Offerman's concerns. And just to share with you at, at Lock Raven Technical Academy, where my daughter goes, they had um, a very loose cell phone policy initially, and then they implemented, the principal implemented a cell phone policy where all of the cell phones are to be kept in lockers. And that led to a decrease in behavioral incidences and many other situations because one of the things that happens with the cell phones is that before cell phones, you could see if a conflict was arising between two students before True. it resulted in a physical altercation. Excellent. And now what's happening is, point. especially in, in middle school where children's interpersonal skills are still developing, it seems like what's happening is these things escalate in text messages or whatever. And then before any adult has the chance to see what's happening and intervene, it just, bl it, it appears in the classroom like it blows out of nowhere and it, it was, it, the incidences of fights in the school reduced because of the cell phone policy. And so they have that policy where the, the cell phones are kept in the lockers and it, it's very strictly enforced. But I think the issue here is that the policies are set by the principal school by school. And I think that it's worth discussing whether or not we should have a system-wide policy. So just a uh, word choice, mm -hmm. the only entity in this system that has the ability to write, pass, and enforce policies is the board. Mm -hmm. It's a board policy. It may be a school rule, but oh, a right. school does not have the authority to have a policy. I understand. So when you use that language, uh, at least in Baltimore County, in Baltimore County, a policy is passed by the board. Thank you. I'll treat it more careful in my vocabulary in the future. Um, but so that, yeah, that's what I think is that if we have procedures in schools that are set up by principals, the principals need flexibility, but at the same time, I feel like this particular thing is something that we should evaluate. Probably the principals of schools will be the best feedback as to whether or not we need a, a system-wide policy and then let the rule hammer out specifically what that is. But the other thing I've seen is when I visited um, one of the high schools in my district, they have one of the classes uses these pouches and the cell phone goes into the pouch and there's a magnetic release. So it goes into the pouch and the pouch is closed and then it requires a magnetic release to open it. So the student is still carrying the cell phone around with them. They just can't use it because the magnetic release is either in the possession of a teacher. It's, it's a lot like the clothing sensors to keep people from stealing clothing, except that closure is the closure for the bag and it's not a pin or anything sharp. It's just that magnetic release technology. Um, and I know they, they use that in one of their classrooms. But I, do th I don't know, um, Ms. Kazi, what is the mechanism for this committee to review if we need a policy or not and get recommendations from staff as to if we should have a, a policy related to this? Because I guess the real question is, does it need to be the same at every school? If it needs to be the same at every school, then we need a policy. If it, or maybe we just need a policy that requires each school to have a procedure and rules set up. Well, I think, I think um, to your point about the mechanism, the board can, I mean, the policy review committee can um, determine if it's a project that we want to start working on and we may say, one member or two members could work with staff on getting input 
Right. Um, I hear you talking about principals, and I agree certainly our uh, school system administrators have their perspective um, dealing with this challenge, um, but also teachers in terms of what's happening individually in their classrooms, um, and then central office uh, in terms of our community superintendents and executive directors with schools seeing system-wide maybe at some grade levels there are certain procedures that are having a greater effect um, so i think that this committee could uh, discuss and decide if this is a project we want to work on we could also um, agree on how we would want to move forward with that miss pasture thank you every school that i have visited this year has talked about the cell phone as a problem and they've all identified the same thing and it goes to what Mrs. Rowe just indicated and um, Mrs. Um, Ms. Howie also pointed out and that is policy and is true every school might have a rule or no rule but it boils down to having some sort of continuity where a policy is concerned and Last week, I was in a middle school where it actually took form, um, and, and actually the principal talked about cyberbullying and, and all of the comments on the cell phone as the number one thing that creates problems within the school. And before I was able to leave the school, an incident occurred that had some attachment to that that ended up with 10 police cars, one supervisor's car, and all of them coming in. Um, and then on Friday, getting from another, um, uh, from a parent, actually, um, a, a, a similar kind of thing, who also verbalized um, wanting um, some sort of policy and then on top of that, having a student in a class whose parent called and the student get, and, and the parent telling the child, get up and come out in the hall and talk to me now. And then that escalated. So there is a call from all concerned to have a policy leaving it up um, administrators generally just don't want to have um, uh, that kind of authority in term final authority on some level. We had a policy, a rule, when um, I was in both of the schools and they were adhered to, but we had to be clear and a part of that was not having teachers and teachers have expressed that while I was still working and beyond, not having to necessarily be the ones to take a phone and be the holder of the phone in the event something happens or escalating in terms of uh, a disagreement between the student and a teacher and a teacher should not have to do that. So the, the ruling was no cell phones out if they come out, the teacher will um, ask the student to put it away. If it doesn't happen, an administrator would handle the issue with a parent, et cetera. But it is one that requires a great deal of discussion because everyone is on very tenuous ground, especially when you talk about one removing property. And no matter how many times you can say um, to a parent or to a child, if there's an emergency, call the office. Because then, if the lines are busy and there is an emergency, what happens? if that child has not been reached. So I do believe that this is an issue that needs to be discussed um, and it needs to be handled in many ways very gingerly because it does involve so many people and so many possibilities for disruption and harm. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Well, you look like I, you wanted I, to I, I guess add additional. Uh, at this point, I, I would, uh, you know, I. I 
I feel maybe even more stronger that we ought to look at this. I guess um, uh, uh, perhaps uh, next step where uh, we go to the whole board and, and see if anyone would like to be, uh, I would like to be involved with this, obviously, that's why I'm bringing it up, but if anyone else would like to uh, be, that would be involved with this, not so much as a policy, at least at this point making a policy, but gathering information and assessing the need of whether a policy is, would even be appropriate to have, okay? And then, you know, and to do that, you would need staff members and we need some way to, you know, uh, some, some kind of system of gathering information in a, you know, in a, in a, in a way that we could uh, differentiate between what, what groups we're talking to. And I would suggest we need to have student input into this too, and parent input to this. Because anything we're gonna do is gonna, you know, no matter what, if we have with, with any kind of policy, uh, I know, you know, for instance, there are a lot of teachers that, you know, cell phones go away and that's the rule, but they don't always go away or they don't stay away the whole time or, you know, what the situation is. And, you know, uh, the, what, what you just alluded to sounds like a really nice way, but I wanna make sure legal can advise us as to what we can do and not do about taking things away from people that way. In terms of having the pouch with the magnet. Right. And, and, well, and, and also there's a fiscal, potential right. fiscal impact right. with that. Right. Well, I think it is under the purview of this committee to um, decide if we want to work on a cell phone policy. And um, as uh, working on it, we can get recommendations from staff on how to gather input. Um, some of that work can be done outside of the committee if there's one or two uh, people that want to work with staff on gathering information and then bring back to the board um, issues around common practices utilized. Also, what is the impact in terms of disruption to instruction? What is the impact on cyberbullying if there are statistics related to discipline events? Um, around how many, what percentage of them involve cell phone use. Um, so I think someone can make a motion to start a cell phone policy. I, I make a motion that we uh, l l look into uh, creating a cell phone policy s system wide upon the, uh, on research provided by us by uh, staff members and, uh, and board members. Is there a second? Thank you, Ms. Pasture, for the second. Is there additional comments, questions? Ms. Adekoya? Um, my only thing is that the intention is clear that it's to look at policies and create a policy that will eventually be for the safety and security of students, that it's not to tear down any group or any student with a cell phone policy or with an incident because with cyberbullying, sometimes the victim gets in trouble as well, so I'm just, looking at it from a full scope, that it's the idea is to implement a policy that's for the safety and security of all students, whether victim or perpetrator. Ms. Pasteur? Yeah, along those same lines, an um, and, and agreement there that in looking at it, you of course have that aspect that might not occur in school. That's right. But the problems are brought to the school and then an aspect of it just in terms of how it's used inside the school. So she is correct, we, it, it, we need to have those layers. And our discipline policy does address the school system um, having the purview of making decisions for the safety of students and the schoolhouse based on events that happen outside the schoolhouse that may have an impact. So we, we do cover that. So that's very important. Yes, Ms. Adequate. Just last, one last thing. Um, with the policies, I think it's always effective when you teach children, just like we're doing the conflict resolution from a young age, so they're, that's in grilled. I don't know if this is a curriculum thing or here. When we create those policies, we also, it's, it's our job to educate the students on the importance of that policy and educate them on the goods and the bads on how to use their phone, cell phone, whether in school or out of school, and why it's so important, why we even created the policy and what issues we were facing, and hit them with the reality of what's going on and why it's important that you play your part. That just, just so it's not just another rule or another law, but hey, this is important. Thank you. Ms. Pasture? Uh, uh, Again, uh, in those same lines, I think it's important to include parents 
and someone said students. Um, and all of the folks um, for whom this will touch. Well, all in favor of uh, Mr. Offerman's motion, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously with a vote of five. And um, are there, is there another, excuse me? Volunteers. What? Volunteers. Yes, are there volunteers for the project? Mr. Offerman and Ms. Pasture? Okay, thank you. Because we can't have a quorum of the policy review committee, so we right. would need to limit it to two. Um, but part of the work would be to determine paths for community input so that we could make sure and have the student right. voice Absolutely. heard. Um, not only through our student member of the board and our uh, Baltimore um, student council leadership, but others, others too. Um, and we do have um, robust surveying software, so um, you can work with staff. Ms. Howie, should you be the point person for the work? Yes, okay, thank you for that. Um, so that takes us to... Thank you, Cheryl. Item number four, and we are duly noting here five minutes ahead of schedule. Um, committee General Good and Welfare. And I did want to bring up an issue where another board member not on policy review had requested that we uh, evaluate transportation policy 3410, which relates to um, not being able to split transportation for our students. Uh, we know that many times in our complex society that we have situations where students may go to one location after school some days or, or some weeks, um, and they may go to another family member on alternating days or weeks. We also know that we have uh, circumstances with working parents and family members that students may have daycare Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at an aftercare program, but then Tuesday and Thursday they may go to a relative's house. So we've heard a number of concerns um, around that, and uh, this particular board member has asked if we could review the policy. So I'm opening up to discussion uh, for policy review committee if we want to add that to our work. Ms. Rowe? I think that we could add it to our work to review the policy. However, I do think that we need to make sure when we review the policy that we get feedback from transportation because I recall that what is being suggested used to be permitted and it caused a good number of problems and there was a reason why the policy was changed to exclude it and the uh, transportation department had very compelling needs for this, um, so I just think if, if it's fine to review anything, but I do think we definitely need their input. Yes, ma'am. Is it on for June? Okay. There we go. The stars are aligned. <laughs> Ms. Rowe. Is are, no before we. Okay, before we finish this one, um, Ms. Howie, could, could we ask with the policy coming forward in June, two questions. One, would the processing time be in time to implement for the fall, or would we want to bring it forward a bit sooner starting in May in order for the timeline? And that's, that, that may be a question you need to explore. If you approve it in June from policy review, I don't think it would be implemented no. until October. I think you're, because number one, you only have one meeting in July. And so that's for a second. I, I think October is what you'd be looking at as far as right. the policy being enacted. All right. Whatever changes you make. So could we bring it forward to May? It's, yeah, it has time to different services, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we are gonna bring it forward in June right. and um, right. in order to have staff to have appropriate time for that. I would just ask that the um, staff 
specifically reach out to AFSCME and get their input um, as the bargaining unit that includes our bus drivers, um, as well as how you normally receive input from administrators and so on. Is there any other aspects to bringing this policy forward? Okay, so thank you very much for that. Um, Ms. Rowe, you said you wanted to address a different issue. So I would like to um, make a motion to bring forward policy 8362, which is board internal operations, the ethics code on gifts. And the reason I would like to bring this forward is because there are a good number of legal campaign finance activities that now that we have elected board members, there's a lot of ambiguity within this policy as to not even just whether certain things are allowed, but things that are allowed that people generally accept are this policy is outdated for the idea that now some of our board members are elected officials. So I think we need to review this policy in light of that fact um, because as elected officials, we have various means of advocating for um, finances within the school system. And some of the things that are in here are prevent all kinds of different activities completely that basically make it difficult to function as an elected official. Would you like to, is there oh, a discussion? Oh, you want me to expound on that? Okay. Well, is there, is there a discussion from other members or do you just want to make a motion and we can? I'd like to make a motion to bring the policy for review and then we can discuss the specifics of the policy when we bring it to review. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Offerman, for the second. And um, you spoke to your motion. Are there other questions or comments regarding that? I think it would be timely to do that also. So the question to staff would be, what would be the appropriate timing to put that on a future agenda? And do you want to review that? And we can discuss that in a agenda planning yeah. phone conference. Okay, so all in favor of adding uh, the gift policy to be reviewed, just raise your hands. Thank you, the motion carries unanimously with the vote of five. And um, Ms. Howie will work with the committee officers to uh, find an appropriate time to put that on the agenda. Is there anything else for the general good and welfare? Okay, I had one last thing that I did want to discuss with the policy review committee, um, is uh, we have our equity policy 0100 which we implemented um, several years ago. Uh, recently, the Maryland State Department of Education has done extensive work around equity, and they have um, additional regulations relate, or guidance related to that. The Maryland Association Boards of Education has put together specific training for boards around uh, the work that has been done on equity. So I thought since this was a fundamental policy for our whole school system and how we want to uh, provide education and um, also treat our employees and staff, um, that it would, instead of starting with policy review committee, that we would um, start it with the full board and um, consider it for an item for a retreat. So I wanted to bring it out here for discussion from policy review to see what you thought about that idea and then to um, talk to staff about preparations that might be made um, regarding that. So I'm opening up to comments. Does everyone agree? And then we can go. <laughs> I think that's an appropriate topic for us to look at particularly during this time. Yes. Okay. And um, I guess Ms. Howie, so I'll make a motion that the um, Policy Review Committee is recommending to the full board to review the equity policy at our board retreat. Okay, Mr. Offerman seconds. Um, is there any discussion to that? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries unanimously at five. And Ms. Howie, I would just ask you to um, look at that policy and how we might uh, present that properly to the board of retreat and we can discuss that in future agenda setting conferences. Okay. And if there's nothing else, 
the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much to the committee and staff. This has been very productive. I really appreciate all of your contributions.